Hello, I'm Monica Embers, and I'm a researcher at Tulane University in New Orleans. I've been studying Lyme disease for about 18 years now, and today I'm going to present a module on antibiotic efficacy for treatment of Lyme disease. Some of the learning objectives for today are first to review the treatment guidelines for Lyme disease. Uh, there are two medical entities that have different guidelines, IDSA and ILADS. Secondly, to define and describe antibiotic tolerance and compare it to uh, antibiotic resistance. Third, to highlight key studies on antibiotic efficacy, uh, primarily from our lab. And four, to consider new strategies aimed at curing the infection. So what I'll be covering first is an overview of human Lyme disease, some of the recommended treatments, an overview of antibiotic efficacy, and what's known as persisters, um, our findings in non-human primates, and treatment goals and new strategies. So Lyme disease itself is uh, a disease that is systemic, spread throughout the body with inflammatory pathology. Lyme disease can affect the skin, uh, showing either a single or multiple erythema migrans rashes. Uh, it can affect the heart, uh, showing pericarditis or myocarditis or both can affect the joints. Um, about 10% of patients have uh, fulminant arthritis. Can affect the nervous system. About 50% of patients in the United States have what's called neuroborreliosis and both the central and peripheral nervous systems can be affected. Um, we know that there is broad suppression of the immune response and I'll, I'll uh, talk about that in a second module. And um, we also know that the musculature can be affected and patients experience myalgia and atrophy. So the IDSA treatment guidelines are as follows. The IDSA or Infectious Disease Society of America recommends that uh, for high risk uh, ixodes species or deer tick bites in all age groups, they recommend the administration of a single dose of doxycycline within 72 hours of tick removal for prophylaxis. For early or early disseminated phase patients who don't have neurological involvement, they recommend a 10-day course of doxycycline or a 14-day course of amoxicillin or cefrimaxatil rather than longer treatment courses. So amoxicillin is reserved for pediatric patients and pregnant women. <clears throat> Uh, if azithromycin is used, which is more commonly used in Europe, the duration is five to 10 days with a seven day course preferred in the United States. For patients with disseminated disease involving arthritis, um, the recommendation is still doxycycline or amoxicillin at the same doses, 200 milligrams for 28 days. And for patients who have clinically evident neurological or cardiac involvement, the recommendation is intravenous ceftriaxone uh, staphylotaxime, penicillin G, or oral doxycycline for 14 to 21 days. In terms of uh, the ILADS guidelines, this is the International Lyme and Associated Diseases Medical Society. Uh, they do not recommend a single dose of doxycycline for prevention of disease. Instead, uh, a known tick bite <clears throat> in an endemic area should be treated uh, according to them with a standard course of doxycycline. So for patients who are infected, a four to six weeks of doxycycline, amoxicillin, or cefiroxime is recommended. A minimum of 21 days of azithromycin is also acceptable. And the pediatric dosing is listed here, amoxicillin 50 milligrams per day. And patients who have persistent symptoms and signs of Lyme disease should be evaluated for other potential causes before instituting additional antibiotic therapy. However, uh, when a chronic Lyme manifestation is judged to be a possible cause of the on, or chronic, chronic Lyme infection is judged to be a possible cause of the manifestations, then this society allows for retreatment of the patient. So this brings up the issue of post-treatment Lyme disease. And these are patients who have been treated with the recommended, the, idea, the IDSA recommended course of antibiotics and continue to have ongoing symptoms. So potential causes for post-treatment Lyme disease include 
First, the induction of inflammatory responses by lingering or dead spirochetes or spirochetal antigen, which could be, um, we know that the spirochetes shed a compound called peptidoglycan that is highly inflammatory. Um, it could be caused by the continuation of active spirochetal infection, or it could also be caused by irreversible sequela from a previous active infection. And we know that there are autoimmune uh, mechanisms in Lyme arthritis. So how is post-treatment Lyme disease defined? Uh, this comes from a study out of uh, Johns Hopkins. Uh, John Alcott is the lead author, and he attempted to uh, come up with a, um, a firmer diagnosis of post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. And so he uh, developed a strategy to assess clinical symptoms and uh, functional decline in his patients. They were all treated, uh, all, this cohort of patients all had physician diagnosed urethema migraines. They were all treated with the same course of doxycycline and they were followed for two years. And basically, 61% uh, of patients had complete uh, recovery. 25% of patients had clinical symptoms only, and 3% had functional decline only. However, 11% of the patients had both clinical symptoms and functional decline. And these are the patients that he characterized as having post-treatment Lyme disease. So let's think about uh, antibiotic efficacy. Doxycycline is uh, by far the drug of choice, uh, the standard of care for Lyme disease. And this antibiotic is microbiostatic. It doesn't kill the bacteria directly, but instead relies on an immune clearance of static bacteria. Uh, the, the drug itself in, interferes with uh, protein synthesis. So when uh, the spirochetes are replicating, it stops them from growing. Uh, Borrelia burgdorferi is known to evade the immune response in many ways. We know that persistence is the norm in immunocompetent hosts. We know that dormant bacteria are more tolerant of microbiostatic antibiotics, and this is the principle of antibiotic resistance and versus antibiotic tolerance. So basically, the slow-growing bacteria are unaffected by the antibiotic. Borrelia burgdorferi survives for many months inside ticks without nutrient replenishment or replication. And there are even some species of uh, Borrelia that have been found in ticks that have been starved for many years and, and are still um, alive, viable. <clears throat> and we finally, we know that Borrelia burgdorferi can be found in deep connective tissues and in joints. So the, the, the tissue penetration of the antibiotic is also very important. So in the murine model of Lyme disease, uh, antibiotic efficacy has been tested. And we know that uh, mice are what we call reservoir hosts for the infection. So in nature, they're a natural host and they don't get very sick. The typical uh, white-footed mouse doesn't get very sick. So um, researchers, namely uh, Dr. Stephen Barthold, uh, tested many different strains of mice to determine if, if he could replicate Lyme disease and found that uh, in, in the mouse model, it was both Lyme disease with both age and genotype dependent, that mice can develop arthritis, carditis, and myositis, that there was intermittent disease and remission with persistent infection, and that there are well-characterized pre-immune and immune phases where you can actually watch uh, the spirochete levels in the tissues and blood rise initially. And then in the post-immune phase, you see a, de a decrease in the, in the spirochetemia, but they're never cleared. Uh, the spirochetes uh, can be detected by culture, PCR, RT-PCR, um, typically in the skin, heart, bladder, spleen, tibiotarsal joints, and skeletal muscle. And uh, post-antibiotic spirochetes are known to be non-cultivable but they are detectable by PCR, RT-PCR, and xenodiagnosis, which is the feeding of uninfected ticks on an animal that's suspected to be infected. And those ticks actually take up the pathogen <clears throat> and you can look inside of them and, uh, and find them. So uh, this, this shows uh, joint swelling in a C3H mouse after infection with Borrelia burgdorferi, uh, two to three weeks of infection. 
This is a spirochete stained by immunohistochemistry in uh, collagenous tissue. And this is a lymph node uh, from a mouse that's been infected for 10 days. So we work primarily with the rhesus macaque model of Lyme disease. And rhesus macaques are known to most closely mimic the human infection. So unlike the other animal models, disease uh, hallmarks that are observed in macaques include the erythema migrans rash, which is rare but has been seen, carditis, arthritis, and importantly, neuropathy of the peripheral and central nervous systems. Mice do not get skin rashes, nor do they become infected in the central nervous system. We also know that the spirochete burden in tissues following dissemination is very small, just as it is in humans. So here are some uh, uh, images of histopathology in non-human primates that have been infected with Borrelia burgdorferi. Here's some inflammation in and around cervical spinal nerve. This was uh, scored by a pathologist as a, a three. Uh, here's uh, inflammation in and around uh, the right sural nerve. Um, and here is a section of parietal pericardium with an aggregate of mononuclear cells. And this is a direct staining of um, Borrelia burgdorferi in the uh, spinal nerve tissue of a macaque. So studies on Borrelia burgdorferi persistence have really focused on three different aspects. The first is the evaluation of chronic disease and residual pathogen post-treatment. So there's a distinction between the disease and the spirochete in terms of uh, post-treatment persistence. Uh, secondly, the impact of pretreatment duration on efficacy. And finally, the viability and phenotype of persistent spirochetes. So one of the first studies examining persistence was done in dogs. And dogs were infected uh, for two months and treated with a 30-day course of amoxicillin or doxycycline. In those dogs, three of the 12 uh, had spirochetes recovered by tissue culture. Skin punch biopsy samples from nearly all of the dogs were PCR positive after treatment. And the most interesting aspect of this is that um, serum antibodies to Borrelia declined after treatment, but the dogs were kept in uh, pathogen-free housing for an additional six months and their antibody titers rose, which could ind indicate recrudescence. Humans have also been studied for persistence. Uh, one uh, group out of Europe showed that skin biopsies taken from EM rashes after treatment, um, in those 1.7% were culture positive. And this is a very, very low number, but this is of course early after treatment, which is much more efficacious than um, delayed treatment. Um, importantly, there was no change in antibiotic susceptibility, which means that the spirochetes that were recovered and cultured were still um, susceptible to doxycycline because they're not, re they're not resistant. They don't have a resistance mechanism. They have a tolerant mechanism. And there was a study conducted more recently in 2014 with human xenodiagnosis. And so patients were fed upon by larval ticks and evaluated by PCR and culture. What the researchers found was that out of 23 patients, 19 were negative, two were indeterminate, one of the early patients was positive, and one of the post-treatment Lyme disease patients was positive. So probably most of the research uh, in this field has been conducted in mice. And um, the, the first studies um, published in 2002 were use, utilized uh, xenodiagnostic ticks. And this group showed that ticks acquired spirochetes from the mice after treatment. And uh, this was detected by fluorescence imaging or PCR. These are two different papers. Subsequently, two studies examined the persistent spirochetes as a function of time elapsed prior to treatment. So uh, what uh, this group, Hodzik and Barthold, showed 
is that spiroketal DNA was more frequently detected in xenodiagnostic ticks that fed upon mice treated four months after infection than those treated three weeks after infection. And when those ticks that had acquired organisms from antibiotic treated mice fed upon a set of naive mice, they detected spiroketal DNA in multiple tissues, which means that the spirochetes disseminated, but they could not regrow the spirochetes. So they are uh, viable, but non-cultivable. And finally, um, a study showing uh, the levels, spirochete loads over time in mice that were treated antibiotics showed that over a period of eight months after treatment, the spirochete levels were extremely low but when the researchers waited until 12 months after treatment, the spirochete levels were just as high as mice that were untreated, which is a clear indication of resurgence. So in 2012, uh, we performed a study or we published a study that was performed in rhesus macaques where we uh, treated monkeys with um, a 28 day course of doxycycline at four months post-infection and uh, perform xenodiagnosis on them and were able to recover intact spirochetes. And this received a lot of attention, but it also received a lot of criticism. So uh, initially we did, did not have pharmacokinetic data uh, for doxycycline and rhesus macaques. We have since performed this and, and showed that the levels that we used in our uh, primates were two and a half times higher than what's used in humans. We also didn't use a tick mediated infection. We injected them with 10 to the eighth spirochetes to infect them. Um, how initial inoculum affects treatment efficacy months later, we don't necessarily know. And the questions of, of the viability of the persistent spirochetes uh, certainly came up. So are they viable, attenuated, are they dormant? Will the spirochetes persist long-term after treatment or are they eventually just cleared from the host? These are questions left to be answered, that were left to be answered. So getting back to the idea of resistance versus tolerance. Resistant bacteria in the presence of an antibiotic will grow normally uh, in a logarithmic way. Tolerant bacteria when treated with the antibiotic will stop growing but they won't die off. So once the antibiotic is lifted, then they will slowly regrow. So the mechanism of antibiotic tolerance, there are multiple mechanisms of antibiotic tolerance, but basically um, the cells enter a, a dormant or slow growing phase. So uh, we began this project, a subsequent project to define persistence in post-treatment Lyme disease. As I mentioned, we performed the doxycycline pharmacokinetics. We assessed persistence following tick-mediated infection, and we attempted to infect naive animals with the persisters. Um, the take-home message for this, uh, fulfilling Koch's postulates, is that uh, we injected uh, both severe combined immune deficient mice and uh, naive non-human primates with the tick, xenodiagnostic tick midgut contents to attempt to establish infection from spirochetes that were recovered from treated animals. And uh, I think the clear message is that the spirochetes need ticks to transmit the infection uh, because it seemed to be a dead end, whether the, whether the um, spirochetes from, came from treated animals or untreated animals, it didn't work. So we began this, uh, this project. We had 10 uh, rhesus macaques that were infected by, uh, by tick bite. And after four months, five of them were treated with 28 days of doxycycline and five were left untreated. And then after several months, we performed xenodiagnosis. And then we performed a second xenodiagnosis and about 11 to 12 months after treatment, we performed a necropsy. So what we found is that only one of the 10 animals developed a bona fide erythema migrans lesion, while others exhibited some diffuse erythema as shown here. This is the tick containment device that we use to feed ticks on non-human primates. 
uh, we took skin biopsies after infection, which resulted in positive detection uh, by culture in five of 10 monkeys and by PCR in eight of 10. Then we perform serology on the animals. And what you're looking at here is the longitudinal antibody responses or antibody levels to five different Borrelia antigens. So um, most of them did not respond to OSPE because it is downregulated uh, when the spirochetes enter the mammal from the tick. But most of the animals responded to the four other antigens, as you can see here. One animal didn't respond at all. Uh, this animal was seronegative, but we know that it was persistently infected. And this animal only generated responses to two of the five antigens, which declined over time. And this animal had very little, uh, if any, um, pathology. So we think it may have self-cured. Then when we looked at the um, xenodiagnostic ticks, uh, we used a different antibody to detect them than what was used in the human xenodiagnosis trials. And the antibody we used targets an antigen expressed by Borrelia when in the tick. So it's highly specific. Um, these are just controls. Uh, this is um, a spirochete in the xenodiagnostic tick midgut from a treated animal, from this seronegative untreated animal, also here. Uh, from another treated animal and from an untreated animal. And then we looked by RT-PCR in the tick midguts to see if we could see transcription of Borrelia genes. And sure enough, uh, we saw transcription of two genes, OSP-A and OSP-C, in ticks recovered, uh, in spirochetes recovered from xenodiagnostic ticks that fed on both treated and untreated animals indicating their viability. Then when we looked at the histopathology and the immunofluorescent staining of four spirochetes in the tissues of the infected animals, we found a lot of interesting things. So these are just the controls for our antibodies. Um, this is tissue spiked with Borrelia where we tested our um, polyclonal antiborrelia antibody and our monoclonal. And this is a merge of the two. So in the brain, uh, we found um, focally expanded regions of inflammation in the, in the uh, leptomeninges and in the brainstem. And in F and G here, these two panels, these are uh, cerebral parenchyma stains showing spirochetes in the tissue. And both of these animals were treated with doxycycline. H and I show different uh, inflammation surrounding peripheral nerves. They have a uh, perivascular um, predilection. Here is another uh, inflammation, image of inflammation in and around the ulnar nerve of an untreated animal. And uh, some more spirochete staining in the um, epineurium and uh, axonal nerve fibers. We also saw some mild inflammation in the heart muscle. The heart muscle. So this is interstitial, and then this is uh, taken from the pericardium. You can see some pretty significant uh, pericardial inflammation, and this is a beautifully stained spirochete in the heart tissue of the seronegative animal, which was treated with doxycycline. Um, this shows uh, inflammation in the skeletal muscle, in the joint tissue, and in the urinary bladder with the uh, addition of spirochetes. Oftentimes we would see these, um, this punctate staining, circular staining. And we took 16 micron sections, 16 micrometer sections. So if the spirochetes are laying flat and we cut we'll see the whole thing. But if the spirochetes are pointing upward and we cut, we'll be taking a cross section. So we looked at this more closely to determine if this um, in the skeletal muscle here was actual um, an actual spirochete. 
And when we did the 3D rendering, you can see here that it has the uh, structure of a cross section of a spirochete. And it's also dual stained with both the polyclonal and monoclonal antibodies. So when we look at the culmination of the histopathology report and uh, the tissues in which uh, spirochetes were identified, we basically found no difference between animals that were treated with doxycycline and those that were, that were not. Of interest, um, these are untreated animals. They were more affected in the peripheral nerves than the treated animals. And the treated animals were more affected in the brain than the untreated animals. So what about, we, we still have this question of viability um, and there are small, a very small number of spirochetes in ticks. Uh, we've done PCR and RT-PCR of the contents and we injected them into skid, uh, severe combined immune deficient mice. And we basically uh, were able to pick up some DNA, uh, but nothing of, of significance. So we think that's probably not uh, a good assessment of viability. And we also knew that we wouldn't be able to culture uh, Borrelia from our necropsy tissues uh, from prior experience, uh, whether they had been treated with antibiotics or not. So uh, we knew that wasn't really an option. Once they've been host adapted, they don't grow well in tissue culture. So what we did was we uh, collected pieces of heart tissue and placed them in a dialysis bag into the peritoneal cavity of rats. So we call this our in vivo culture system. So instead of taking them to a nutrient rich um, incubator with, with, with everything they need, we use the animal as the incubator. And lo and behold, uh, we did find spirochetes. The tissue was necrotic, but the spirochetes were by and large still intact. This is from a treated animal, and this is from an untreated animal. And we sent the RNA, or we sent the tissues actually, to a, a separate lab, blinded them to the identity of the samples. Um, and he came back with uh, RT-PCR positives in two treated animals and in one untreated animal. So in summary, um, for a tick-mediated infection and treatment study, erythema migrans was produced from one of 10 monkeys, all but one animal seroconverted. Moderate pathology was seen in various tissues from both the treated and untreated animals. We detected intact spirochetes by immunofluorescence of xenodiagnostic ticks and affected tissues of treated and untreated animals. Uh, we sent a variety of necropsy tissues out to look for Borrelia transcripts, which were not detected, probably because they're in such low number. But we did show persistence of live Borrelia confirmed by RT-PCR of heart tissues cultured in vivo and by xenodiagnostic tick staining using anti-ospe monoclonal antibody. So in conclusion, our results demonstrate host-dependent signs of infection and variation in antibody responses. We also observed evidence of persistent, intact, metabolically active Borrelia burgdorferi after antibiotic treatment of disseminated infection and showed that persistence may not be reflected by maintenance of specific antibody production in the host. So we believe that the histopathology findings support the notion that the chronic Lyme disease symptoms could be attributable to residual inflammation in and around tissues that harbor a low burden of persistent host-adapted spirochetes or residual antigen, especially when the nervous system is affected. So we have now um, switched gears into identifying therapies that can eradicate the infection. And uh, there have been a number of different in vitro studies uh, testing different types of um, FDA approved drugs in uh, monotherapy and in combination. Uh, shown here are a couple of publications um, showing combinations that were uh, fairly effective. And um, probably the most well-known is the daptomycin, um, cefoprazone and doxycycline combination. 
And pulse dosing is something that has been uh, suggested. And in vitro, there is some efficacy, uh, it, but it depends on the antibiotic type. And this has not been directly tested in animal models. So uh, in animals, uh, there is one study showing um, the testing of uh, persistent spirochetes in mice. And uh, the combination of daptomycin, doxycycline, and ceftriaxone was able to clear this infection. And then there's another uh, sort of newer study showing that azlocillin might have some potential uh, in the treatment of, of Borrelia burgdorferi infection. So um, things to think about. Uh, what mechanisms of Borrelia allow it to persist despite a competent post-immune system and antimicrobial therapy? So we know that Borrelia has multiple mechanisms of immune evasion. We know that the host response is variable. We see that with our just looking at antibody responses. And we also know that it's part of their life cycle to enter this slow growing dormant phase, which will reduce the efficacy of microbiostatic antibiotics. So what are the gaps in research, uh, in my opinion, that need to be addressed uh, with respect to antibiotic efficacy? First of all, we need to know how the immune response uh, affects treatment efficacy with the standard regimens and whether or not this can be predicted. Can we predict if a patient is going to respond well to the treatment regimen or not? What other drugs may be more efficacious uh, than what we're using now? Specifically, we want those that target Borrelia persisters or have a direct microbicidal mechanism. And can elimination of persisters cure the chronic form of disease? So if we get rid of the spirochetes, does that mean that we're gonna get rid of disease or do they induce a, a cycle of chronic inflammation? What biomarkers might indicate the etiology of disease? Chronic inflammation, arthritis, or persistent infection? So with that, I will conclude and leave you with uh, relevant references.